Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the session on the Patent Prosecution Highway. My name is Jay Erstling, and I will be moderating the session um, and also serving as a speaker. Um, I want to introduce our distinguished panelists to you and then um, let you know how we're going to run this session. Uh, it is going to be a little bit different in that we're going to invite your participation uh, throughout the, the session. So we want you to feel free to be able to, um, to speak up. We're going to start by each one of us making a very short presentation and then um, opening up the session to questions and to, and to a, a discussion. Um, as I said, my name is Jay Erstling. I am uh, currently uh, a senior attorney at uh, an IP law firm in Minneapolis, Minnesota called Patterson Tinty. Previously, I was the director of the Office of the Patent Cooperation Treaty um, at, at, at WIPO um, and was very much involved in the elaboration of the PPH. Um, to my le left uh, is Upasana Patel, who is a partner in the Singapore office of Marks and Clark. She's both a Singapore and a UK chartered patent attorney. Her s field of uh, specialization as a patent prosecutor is chemical, biopharmaceutical engineering, pharmaceutical, nano and clean technology, and I recently learned food technology, which is the coolest technology. And she has special um, emphasis and, and expertise in the, um, in the ASEAN region, which she will be talking about during the session. To my extreme right is um, Hinorobu Hattori, who, as some of you may know, who were at the ceremony, the award ceremony last night, is the recipient of a GIPC award. Um, Hiro is a partner in Nakamura and Partners in Tokyo. Uh, he is, does both patent prosecution and litigation. His specialization is in chemical and medical fields and his client base comes from all over the world. My direct left is Raj Dave, who is the president and founder of the Dave Law Group in the US, which has the distinction of having offices directly across the street from the US Patent and Trademark Office in Alexandria, Virginia. He's also professor and chair at the Gujarat National um, Law University. Uh, his practice is, is fairly, um, unusual and eclectic in a wonderful way. He focuses on IP counseling, dispute resolution, licensing, tech transfer, and IP mining in addition to prosecution. And he also facilitates the financing of patent litigation through alliances with investor groups, which is probably a uniquely US practice. Yeah. And finally, to uh, my right is P.D. Gupta, who is a senior advocate at the Supreme Court of India and also head of litigation and senior technical advisor at L.S. Davar and Company. He specializes in software technology and engineering and particularly spends his time on complex IP cases. So that's who we are. Um, I'm just going to begin by doing a little bit of an introduction to what we mean by PPH and to talk to you a little bit uh, about its, its history and um, development. Um, as you can see from the slide, um, the, when you look at PPH, it seems complicated, but when you apply PPH, uh, it, it becomes rather logical and elementary and the best thing is, for at least from my perspective, it tends to have great benefits. Um, so what, in fact, is the patent prosecution highway? Um, it, it is a procedure. 
procedure, it's a procedural framework um, that was first proposed by Japan uh, that now has been accepted worldwide. Uh, and it's a procedure in which an application whose claims have been allowed in one office, in a first office, is eligible to go through an expedited examination in a second office. Um, in order to invoke PPH, that involves a relatively simple procedure and it is completely at the applicant's request. There's a certain terminology involved with PPH and the terminology differs a little bit based on uh, the type of PPH that you are applying because there are several. Sometimes you talk about an office of first filing and an office of second filing and sometimes you talk about an office of earlier examination and an office of later examination. But basically it, it all means the, the same thing. As I mentioned, there are several types of PPH which we will talk about today. Oh, sorry. Um, there's traditional PPH, PPH Motanai, which Hiro will talk about in particular, PCT PPH, and global PPH. Right now, uh, the India-Japan agreement um, includes the first two types of PPH. Hopefully in the future, it will join uh, other types of PPH as well. Uh, while PPH is new to India, it's not new to the world. Uh, PPH was actually first proposed uh, in 2005 at a meeting of the trilateral patent offices. The trilateral patent offices are the USPTO, European Patent Office, and the JPO. Um, I actually was attending that meeting because I was the director of the PCT at the time and um, I served as the PCT representative to different sorts of global meetings, including that one. And um, when I, although I've got to say that PPH has now been very, very broadly accepted um, and applauded and uh, almost glorified, uh, when the Japan Patent Office first proposed it, it was met with a lot of suspicion. Um, and so in fact, we have the JPO to thank because without their perseverance, and conviction that it would work, um, we would not be having PPH, PPH today. PPH once started, expanded rapidly, both in terms of the types of models that were being used for PPH, as well as its global, uh, global acceptance. The key to PPH um, is that the claims in the second application have to sufficiently correspond to the allowable claims in the first application so that in fact the examination report, the search report, that the second office will be able to look at can actually serve as a positive resource. Um, the purpose of PPH, as I mentioned, is to provide uh, an additional resource, the search report of an earlier office, uh, so that the second office can benefit from the results of that search. What's important to keep in mind is that the second office is never obliged to accept the findings. It, it merely um, is able to look at them and it allows the application that claims PPH basically to jump to the head of the queue to have expedited examination. The benefits of PPH are, are many. Um, generally, they save costs for the applicant because there tend to be fewer search reports, fewer office actions that are issued. There's streamlined prosecution. There's um, uh, the fact that an application is, is, is um, examined out of turn makes prosecution quicker. Overall pendency gets reduced. And particularly for offices, the fact that they are able to have a, an additional set of eyes, basically, allows for both more efficient and, um, and, and, and better quality examination. The world of PPH now, the, the PPH network, uh, with India being the newest member of that network, as you can see, is quite extensive. There are now 50 countries 
that are participating in one level or another uh, in, in the PPH. Uh, I'm not gonna take time looking at the statistics, but if you were to look at the statistics, you would see that in virtually every country that has PPH, um, the, the results have been beneficial. Uh, pendency is shorter, there are fewer office actions, the grant rate is higher, and the first action grant rate uh, is, is higher. Um, and that is not necessarily because the second office that is granting the application uh, is under any obligation to, to grant, but rather because with the additional resources, resource that the second office has, it's able to uh, act more, more um, quickly. Uh, and this final slide is really here to point out uh, how widespread um, PPH has become, particularly in the United States, where it is virtually common, common practice. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Uh, where it has virtually become uh, common practice and the number of PPH requests from various offices, as you can see, are in the thousands and the tens of thousands. Um, so from my perspective, uh, I applaud and congratulate India on becoming part of PPH. Um, and my wish is that India's involvement and role in the system just continues to expand and grow. So now Upasana is going to, um, is going to be nothing, it appears. No, we haven't. Uh. Well, when the slides come on, talk about PPH in the ASEAN region. Well, while, while we're waiting, um, perhaps I can just, just start introducing the ASEAN region. Um, so for those of you who don't know where ASEAN is, I actually had a slide that should be coming up pretty soon um, to show you. So it's basically Southeast Asia, um, but ASEAN is basically stands for Association of Southeast Asian Nations. And what the 10 countries, it, it's basically got 10 countries and um, There we go. So that's the world map. That's where ASEAN is, the one in red. And if we just zoom, um, those are the 10 member countries of the ASEAN region. Um, all of them have IP laws, except for Myanmar, who currently only has trademark laws, which just got enacted uh, late last year. Um, the patents bill has already been passed, but it hasn't come into force yet. So. Um, when I talk about ASEAN going forward in my presentation, I'm going to exclude Myanmar, and basically um, it, it covers the other nine member countries, of which Singapore is one of them. So all these countries have very different um, economic and social standings, um, but they do share a common goal of accelerating growth in trade and investment. And they all recognize that the protection of IP is the way forward. So um, from my personal experience of what I'm seeing, the trend in patent filings, for example, um, or rather just IP filings in general in the region, it's really ramping up, um, particularly because a lot of companies are now setting up uh, manufacturing bases in countries such as Indonesia, Vietnam, and Thailand. Um, in terms of patent filings, just to give you an overview, from 2011 to 2017, there was a ba basically a 37.5% increase in the number of patent filings in accumulated across the region. Now, what are the patent <coughs> offices like um, in these countries? Um, other than Singapore, I would say in all the other countries, generally examination <coughs> is quite slow. 
Um, you can see there on the slide what's the average uh, pendency uh, to, to receive your first office action, and it's more than a year in most of the countries. Um, so what, what, you know, the countries came together and said, well, we need to do something about this. And what we decided was, let's come up with a sort of PPH type program. Um, and they've called that uh, ASPEC, which stands for the uh, ASEAN Patent Examination Corporation Program. Okay. From, from when I, you know, when I speak to foreign associates, it seems that many have not actually heard of ASPEC. So I'm trying my best to push, you know, every time we go for conferences or, or meet overseas um, associates, we really try to tell them about this because, you know, it, like, like Jay said, PPH is actually a great thing to accelerate um, movement of your patent applications. So ASPEC has been introduced since 2009. So it's effectively a work sharing program um, across the ASEAN member states. Uh, what I've also done on this slide is just to give you an overview as to what other PPH programs are in place in some of the more popular countries in which um, people are filing in. So for Singapore, um, it's got uh, bilateral PPH agreements with European Patent Office, the Chinese Patent Office, as well as the Mexican Patent Office. We're also part of uh, the global PPH, um, aspect like, I mean, they're all part of aspects, so I'll leave that one out for now. For Malaysia, it's JPO, EPO, and the Chinese Patent Office. Vietnam is Japanese, and very recently the Korean Patent Office. Indonesia is just the Japanese. Philippines, likewise, JPO, EPO, US, PTO, and Korean. And the Thailand, uh, it's with the JPO. So you can see that JPO is very actively reaching out to these ASEAN countries and making bilateral agreements with them. Why is Singapore not doing a bilateral with JPO? <laughs> but it's, it's because we're part of global, so it, it actually doesn't matter. So we don't need to have a, a single bilateral uh, PPH with J JPO. Um, this is just to give you an idea of, you know, what the aspect statistics are like. There, I mean, it's, it's increasing the number of aspect requests being filed. Um, what's interesting to note is that you will see that for Singapore as the second um, member country, uh, it's blank. The reason is because, like, like I showed in my previous slide, because it's just so fast to get um, uh, an allowance in Singapore, then most of the time what people do is they get their allowance in Singapore and then use that to request um, aspect uh, and accelerate examination in the other member country. All right, um, so now what I'm going to do, um, oh yeah, just to, these are fairly new initiatives that were launched last year uh, with regards to ASPEC. So now ASPEC just doesn't just cover uh, allowances that you receive from other member countries and use it in yet another member country, but you can also now use your PCT and then use your PCT report to request for the PP PCT ASPEC. Um, so that's an extension of ASPEC that has come into force last year. And the other thing that ASPEC has also done is um, with regards to AI filings, if you have a patent application in the AI field, uh, you can file an ASPEC request to speed it up. So within technical areas, they're trying to encourage ASPEC as well. So does ASPEC work? It's mixed reviews. Now what's actually happening is that while it is a great thing because it's actually expediting um, prosecution and examination in the other member countries where normally it takes such a long time, what's actually happening is that um, there's still some mindset issues with the examiners in these other countries. Um, what's one interesting thing I want to point out is when we use when we request ASPEC on a Singapore application in, say, one of the other member countries, it goes through in the other countries, everything goes through quite smoothly. However, if we don't request ASPEC and there's actually a Singapore application that has been allowed, finally, the examiners tend not to look at the Singapore application's allowance, but asks the applicant to conform the claims to corresponding Japanese, European, or US 
um, allowed claims. So the mindset of the examiners is still, oh, you know, I'm still regarding these three patent offices to be a bit more superior uh, in the quality of their examination, and I'm going to be following that rather than look at other member countries or, or you know. So, so what's interesting to note, basically, is that when you do it with an aspect request, they do look at the Singapore application, but when there's no aspect request, they prefer that it be looked at the US or the Japanese results instead. So that's, that's what I mean by examiner mindset. There's also differences across the countries with patentability criteria, so some, you know, particularly in the pharmaceutical field. Um, so that could impact on whether PPH would actually work in these countries. Um, lack of skills of the examiner, I think that's a common problem across um, different jurisdictions, particularly in developing nations and of course backlog issues. So now what I'm gonna quickly do is go into individual countries within, not all of them, but just the ones that are more commonly, uh, patent applications being commonly filed at. Um, so for Singapore, as, as I mentioned earlier, we've got bilateral and we've also got um, the global PPH that we're involved in. Um, we were actually, it's, it's really fast to get patent application in Singapore and another initiative that um, IPOS, which is the Singapore Patent Office, what they've done is they actually have um, a program to accelerate in the fintech and AI. Uh, so without any PPH, you just request accelerated examination in these two fields. So it speeds up getting your patent application even faster. We, I mean, we've had a case of an Alibaba case which was granted within six months. And it was then used to expedite examination in the other country. So that's what's commonly done. Um, now, as you know, um, just earlier this year, we are abolishing the modified examination route, which uh, previously was very commonly used by many applicants. So now all patent applications in Singapore have to go through local substantive examination. In view of the abolishing of the modified examination, we feel that perhaps um, reliance on requesting examination with PPH is actually going to increase, but that we will have to wait and see since, you know, first Jan just happened, so we're going to see what, how things change. For Malaysia, what's interesting is that they too have a modified examination route. So if you have an allowed patent in, say, Australia, JP, Korea, UK, US, or EP, you can easily just, so there's no, mod, uh, you know, you don't have a PPH request or anything. It's called modified examination. It's cheaper than substantive examination. Just conform and pretty much always it goes straight to allowance after that. So because of that, there's this, I, I, I have, I mean, applicants tend to do that route rather than actually request um, PPH via ASPEC or with the JPO, EPO because Aspect just means that it accelerates substantive examination, okay, might not lead to allowance straight away, whereas in modified examination, you pretty much get your Malaysian patent straight away. As for Vietnam, as I mentioned, Korea is the new addition to the PPH program that Vietnam has, um, but they've had the, the collaboration with the JPO since 2016. And what's interesting is that uh, in 2016, it took a few months for the quota to be filled up. In 2017, it was finished up in less than two months. And 2018 and 2019, all done in one day. Within one day, all 100 slots for requesting PPH with the JPO was taken up. So now what they've implemented basically is in, in two batches. So they've got uh, six month um, windows and what they're actually encouraging is for you to pre-prepare all your forms so that the minute the window opens, you submit your application for PPH. So it's, it's hugely popular. Um, the Korean one kicked off uh, last year, so um, it's going pretty well, but not as fast as the JPO. And you might wonder why JPO and, and Korean Patent Office. Um, and the reason is because um, a lot of the filers of patent applications in Vietnam uh, actually originate from Japan and Korea. And I'm down to my last slide, which was actually Thailand. Um, okay. 
So Thailand has a PPH with the JPO and allowance, um, they have huge backlog issues but with the PPH, you can actually expedite your examination quite, uh, quite fast to 50% of the time, so it's great. Um, and Aspect as well is the other one that can help to expedite. So these are just things I wanted to share about that region. Um, and I'll leave you in the good hands of Jay again. So my biggest takeaway from that talk is that regardless of the arrangements that you use, whether it's Aspect, PPH, um, PCT PPH, which is based on the search report and written opinion rather than an, an allowed claim. The idea of work sharing, of collaboration amongst offices is becoming extremely important. And the reasons for that um, are, I, I would imagine, that simply with the number of applications increasing, the complexity of the applications increasing, offices need the help of other offices in order to be able to continue their job properly. But since all of this is due to the Japan Patent Office, um, which really was the initiator even of the idea of work sharing in general, hearing what Hiro has to say is important. Oh no, excuse me. Hearing what P.T. Gupta has to say about India is important. Sorry about that. Good afternoon, everybody, all the delegates, and uh, my co-panelist. Yes, I agree. The, this is the toughest session in the conferences. Actually, I have been attending our, uh, a lot of conferences. Just uh, the session after lunch is the toughest one. <laughs> but we will uh, definitely try to make it interesting to all our delegates. As Jay said, that I'm, uh, I was insisting that uh, India is also equally important. Uh, admittedly, JPO has proposed this uh, G PPH program and uh, India has actually uh, last in November 2019 has accepted and signed the bilateral treaty. Now, uh, first uh, Jay had said that uh, I'm from Ellis Dower and Company. I must take this opportunity to just have a few words about our uh, organization. Uh, LS Dower and Company, you know, is a full service intellectual technical, uh, intellectual property law firm, which was founded in 1932. Having an history of uh, more than 88 years, almost. And it was uh, founded by uh, one Mr. LS Dower. He was, uh, barrister of law, and then firm's present chairman is uh, his son, Mr. G.S. Dower. He is an electrical engineer, and he was uh, trained in IP in Germany. And uh, presently, uh, his uh, daughter, Dr. Yoshita Dawar Kemani, she is also an attorney at law, and uh, she is, uh, in fact, a uh, uh, managing partner of the firm at the moment. And the firm has been uh, receiving various uh, numer numerous uh, international awards uh, from various industrial organizations and uh, offices. This one. We, uh, our experience uh, actually it's for several decades and uh, we have been uh, fe felicitated by various uh, IAM, IP stars, Economic Times, 
various uh, media and educational institutions and all. Uh, we, uh, many of the 500 fortune companies, small, medium-sized enterprises, government-funded industries, they are all we are serving uh, or giving them uh, advices on uh, IP law protection. And uh, we are uh, having actually is a worldwide uh, intellectual property portfolio, all litigation disputes. Actually, we have a tradition of focusing on practical aspect of the issues. <clears throat> we have actually our exemplary memberships are this, and then we have our global presence all over the world. And apart from India, we have our uh, offices. Uh, it, you can say these are uh, our uh, offices through our old associates in the neighboring countries of Nepal, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, and Myanmar. Now, with this small background, I'll, uh, and these are some of the awards. Uh, you can have a look. And I feel proud to talk about these awards and uh, you know, recognition of LS Tower and Company, because being a traditional law firm, we have been thriving uh, to provide most modern technological and legal services to our uh, clients, and you can say various uh, government departments. In uh, uh, you know, we have been also interacting with the government for. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Indian uh, patent law, uh, where it has to be amended, how, what are the practical problems coming up. So we are taking as a stakeholder a major part in, uh, in a development of Indian patent law or IP law. Now, here I now come uh, to bilateral PPH program, and uh, Jay has already uh, explained mostly uh, the, this part of uh, PPH program. Now, as far as what, which I would like to say, just a bit of practical aspects, that uh, this bilateral program was actually signed or started on November 21st, 2019, and then the requests for PPH assignment of status has started from 5th of December 2019. Now, this will be, of course, beneficial for the faster grant of patents in India as well uh, in Japan. And it will also help Indian startup in patenting in Japan and vice versa. Now, at present, it's a, it has been started as a pilot program. So at present, no applicant can file more than 10 PPH application in a an year. And altogether, it should not be more than 100 per year. Now there is, as we have been talking about PPH, Jay has given, because he was actually involved in implementation and uh, Japan Patent Office has, uh, is the initiator. Uh, actually, 2005, uh, November, I think it was uh, proposed by Japan Patent Office to, to US, but it actually, uh, PPH, global PPH had started in the year 2006, practical thing. And uh, then, uh, uh, in fact, in uh, PPH, if you happen to see, there are two elements. We are talking about PPH, Patent Prosecution Highway. But let's see what is this. Now first is, is that we have to get a status of PPH that we can get under Form 5.1. So there is PPH guideline and according to that, as an Indian, uh, say, startup, I file a Form 5.1 application for getting a status of PPH. Well, I'm accorded a, a status, and I file my application in the early office, that is Indian Patent Office, and then it goes to Japan Patent Office. The second part of PPH is that 
when I get a status of uh, uh, PPH through my Form 51, then I have to file an expedited examination request. That's the second part of PPH. Mostly we are not concerned, uh, we are making both of them together, but there are two parts, or two elements, as I said, that we have to again file uh, an application for expedited examination. The whole purpose, of course, for PPH was for expedited grant, prosecution, and grant. Here the two elements are that, getting a status of PPH and then making an application for expedited examination. Now, here, uh, as I uh, said here, that there are now is some restrictions that not a particular applicant, he can file more than 10 applications in a an year, and uh, altogether there cannot be more than 100 uh, per year. Now, yes. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was just going through this, uh, you know, uh, about expedited examination. And there are two categories. In, in Japan also, JPO, they have got some category of inventions and application, applicants who can file for expedited examination. And in India, we have got certain category of uh, patent applicants who can file for expedited examination. Now, in India, there are small entities, a female applicant. If the applicant is a female and she is a sole applicant, she can file, and then an, a government undertaking, he, uh, they, they can file for expedited examination, and then and similarly, a foreign government undertaking, a Japanese government undertaking, they can also file for an expedited examination. And then the applicants who have been assigned the status of PPH. So these are the five categories who can file in India expedited examination. Similarly in Japan, who can, even after achieving uh, the status of uh, PPH, the applicant can certainly file an expedited examination request in Japan as well as in India. But apart from that, who else can file in Japan? In Japan, you, uh, you, uh, one can file for working-related patent applications. Now, what is this working-related patent applications? Why I am explaining this? Because this is the issue what we have taken up recently with the government of India. Now, what is working related applications in Japan? If an invention has been commercialized or likely to be commercialized within two years from the date of filing, that is termed as working related, related applications and they can get the advantage of expedited examination. In Japan, I'm talking about. And then in Japan, there are SMEs, universities, public research institution, then green technology. This is a, uh, this technology, applications from this technology, they can get the facility of expedited examination in Japan. And then earthquake disasters, support, they are, those inventions are also getting expedited examination facility in Japan. Now these are the two aspects I, I just wanted to explain to you because these are also the other areas with PPH that has to be considered. Now, coming back to Uh, this por portion, I think, I can uh, skip because Jay has already said about the uh, first office and second office who can file an application and then it will go to the second office and what are the documents required. Now, that also has been mostly said. Now.
Yes, this is one point that uh, if examination of any patent application has already been started, thereafter no request for PPH should be granted. Now, the comparison of granted claims, verified, translated copies should be submitted at the time of application for PPH. That means when we filed Form 5.1, we have to file these are the documents. And then we have to file, once we get the status, we have to file, as I explained to you in details, uh, a request for expedited examination. Now, uh, here we have to give, these are the documents that copies of references cited by the early first examination office, and that copies of all claims determined to be patentable, and then copies of office actions and then claim correspondence table, that is what we call as the claim chart. And uh, now it is expected to have mostly benefit for the startups in India and in also uh, in Japan. That's uh, one uh, issue what this guideline says. If you happen to see the PPH guideline, it says that this guideline for execution of PPH shall be according to individual practice for either IPO and JPO. This is uh, one of the most crucial point. We are not yet sure what would be the solution for this. Why I'm telling you? Now, for the PPH program, that uh, the details this uh, matter will be discussed by Dr. Raj Dave. But in India, we have got, in India, we have got certain exclusions which will have uh, a problem. Suppose novelty, inventive step, other areas are confirmed. But in India, there are special exclusions. How that will be dealt? Dr. Dave, Raj Dave will be giving us some light on that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we've heard from India now, and with apologies again, we hear from the Japanese side. So before setting my slides, I, I wanted to say thank you for the Jay and other uh, speakers for uh, having an uh, opportunity to speak here. And uh, I will speak about uh, what is the uh, uh, actual way to file the PPH, that it's real world for uh, fighting a PPH as a practitioner. And before starting my presentation, I wanted to teach all of you the word of Motai nai, Japanese motai nai. So which is also used in the PPH system. The motai nai is a word meaning of what the waste. So a sense of regret, wasting something. So like my grandma always saying, why you are throwing away of um, some kind of the bottle or something? You can use again and again and again and that is a motai nai. And uh, Dr. Matari, she's uh, getting a Nobel Prize in 2004, also used the word of the motai nai. And she says three kinds, reduce, recite, uh, reuse, and recycle. And this is also used for the PPH uh, slogan, the reducing the examination period and fees, 
reuse examination result and recycle the invested fund monies. And so there's two ways to use a PPH. A and B, A is the normal way of the PPH. First, Indian application was filed and getting the uh, allowance, like using the, Mr. Gupta says, five category of uh, ex uh, expertise examination system and get the allowance. Then moving on to the Japanese application, we can file the PPH re request based on the allowance of Indian patent office. The next one, B is the shifted. Even the first uh, office, office is India and then Japanese application is filed. Japanese application was allowed, allowed before allowance of India. Then we can use the outcome of the allowance in Japan to expedite the Indian application. So this is PTH Motainai. So we can use both way. Of course, US and India has no bilateral uh, agreement of the PPH. We cannot use outcome from the US PTO to Indian Patent Office. And if you file PPH, you will concern about the, what kind of document, especially translation. Of course, Japanese Patent Office received Japanese uh, translation of the application. But after that, using a PPH, we are not requested to file any Japanese translation. We don't need to file translation. So Japanese Patent Office take the copy of the working uh, product, which is office action, allow, allow the claim in English as well, and cited reference as is. So this is actual format of the PPH request. So first, uh, we should file, uh, uh, we should add the application number, and then uh, Indian office, uh, Indian patent office, then the, what is the Indian uh, application number? So three things, just filled out. <coughs> then we are requested to uh, click the copy copy of the working product, which is office action, and translation, whether we have a Japanese translation or English translation. And also we are requested to click, uh, check the uh, copy of the allow, allowed claims, which is al uh, available all in English or Japanese. So just uh, click all the things. And most of the case, of course, in India, if we file the Indian application in English, we can get the English English uh, claims, yeah, office action as well. Just click, 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 four clicks. That's it. For the cited reference, if uh, if we have a cited uh, some cited reference, we can just file the copy of the cited reference. No translation is required. Just click. Then we can also omit the copy of the cited difference if the cited difference is available in the uh, patent scope or uh, dossier system. Most of the case, we can get the copy from the patent scope or dossier, so it is not necessary to file the copy of the cited difference. Just click. And finally, we should check the uh, the claim, uh, claim chart. If the claim are exactly the same as the first office, the claims, we just click the first uh, scale. The most of the case, we can change the claims a little bit, like uh, dependency or something. We should make the chart like this. And there is a space, space are very limited. So we just say, some similarity or uh, the dependency is different, that's it. No specific more uh, detail is not required. 
And also, we don't need to explain about the patentability. So this is the format. That's it, taking uh, one or two minutes. So in this case, we cannot charge <laughs> on, based on making the PPH, but very easy, very easy. This is a format in, in uh, India. The difference is translator's uh, certification. Just sign form and file it and provide the copies and that's it. Check mark, that's it. How, you know, this is the easiest way to expedite, expedite uh, acceler accelerated the examination, examination. So if you have any applications to expedite in Japan or India, the PPH is a good source, good uh, way to use the system. Thank you. So w would you say that PPH Motainai is PPH in reverse? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you just switch the second, yeah, yeah. The second yeah. office yeah. and the You're first right. office. So, and finally, uh, we turn to Rajave, who is going to talk about some of the more complex issues related to PPH. Thank you very much, Jay. Uh, I have uh, had a wonderful panel, and they did a great job. And my goal here is to talk about some of the practical aspects of PPH uh, based on my 25 years of experience, but primarily doing a lot of PPH between US and some of the other countries. Uh, I'm a US attorney uh, living in US from 1981, but for the last two years I've been in India. I also have an office in Bangalore and as well as in Paris in, in France. So we do use PPH quite frequently because of the fact that we have multiple offices. and. What I would like to do, we can go to the next slide. Yeah, what I would like to do is just give a very brief overview. What is PPH, okay? We already talked about it, but to summarize, let's say there's a US patent application where claims A and B are allowed. There's an international search report uh, which basically says there's no prior art regarding inventive slip, and you file a corresponding application in Japan, claim one is the same as claim A, claim two is the same as claim B, you make that certification uh, in, the in the forms, and the expedited examination happens under PPH, and usually we see the cases getting allowed. Now, the question is the following. What is the difference between the PPH versus a non-PPH where the same claims A and B were allowed in the United States? And I submit all the documents to the Japanese patent office and ask them to look at it. Shouldn't they also allow my US uh, Japanese claims because after all, they're the same, and they've been examined by the US examiner. The answer is, as exactly what uh, Upasana said, you know, there's a mindset in the examiner's mind that if it's gone through the PPH route, it is blessed, and the claims are truly valid and allowable. Whereas if it's not gone through the PPH route, the claims, how you know, are not necessarily allowed or allowable, okay? It's, what you are seeing exactly we see that. But think of it, what's the difference? There's no real difference. Whether you go through a PPH route or if the claims get allowed in US and you submit the file history and the prosecution and you pro provide everything to the patent office. But you know, the outcomes are quite different and I see that all the time. And so, of using PPH strategically can be very valuable. So my point is when we work with our client, very beginning at the start, 
we decide what route we are going to take. If you are going to take the PPH route, okay. and then you do know that these, especially now today in America, if you know that you're going to be hit by a 101 rejection under Alice, you know, you're much smarter off to first get the, those claims allowed in a country like Japan, where it's becoming a little bit easier, and then come to United States under the PPH route and say, hey, the claims have already been granted valid. Now, the other interesting thing Jay mentioned is, he said, even though you submit the PPH, and he was part of the process of getting the PPH off the ground, that even though you submit the claims and applications under the PPH, the uh, second office does not have to mandatorily accept the results of the first office. The truth is, how many examiners actually understand that and actually take the trouble of uh, reviewing the case all over again under the PPH, uh, under the PPH uh, pathway? My experience is they don't. If, it, if it's a PPH pathway, generally the examiners believe for whatever reason that the first office, uh, whichever has granted, the, allowed the case, the, uh, has done a good job and therefore, and they have an obligation to also allow the same claims. That said, what I would like to do is go to the next slide and talk about some uh, practical issues. First practical issue as it pertains to Japan and India is today in Japan, the trend for computer implemented invention is that the allowance rate is coming close to 70%, okay? And if you look back in 2005, 2006, it was somewhere like 10%, okay? What changed? The way the Japanese examination takes place today, they are much more liberal in giving, granting computer implemented inventions, okay? On the other hand, let's look at India. In India, we have section 3K. Section 3K has this question, uh, a point that a computer program per se is not patent eligible, okay? And when we file patents in India, anything that has a computer related invention, the first thing you will see is an in rejection under section 3. Okay, is uh, PPH route uh, going to be a way to get around our section 3K? Maybe, and that's why some of the possible outcomes of India-Japan PPH would be higher allowance rate in India for computer implemented inventions because the fact that those claims have been allowed in Japan and if we are going to try to uh, live with each other's obligations, maybe India will start allowing higher percentages of computer implemented uh, inventions, patents on computer in implemented inventions. Or hopefully there'll be more clarity in the rules for patentability of computer in, uh, implemented inventions in India and the Indian examiners will have a chance to learn from the examination pro process in Japan. So those are definite uh, possibilities. And then we, at this point, I'd really leave it up, up for all of you to ask questions. But in short, I would say for India, Japan, PPH to be successful, Really, it's the practical aspects that is going to make the difference. And uh, we would like to hear questions from you. And uh, to the best of our knowledge, we'll try to answer them. Um, actually, before we take questions from the audience, can I have a show of hands of 
those of you who have already had the opportunity to use PPH? Uh, Stephen, what? regarding the, uh, um, what seems to me essential to be a forum shopping approach. So you find the jurisdiction, which gives you the most favorable chance of getting claims allowed, <clears throat> move prosecution along in that jurisdiction quickly and then translate that across. And that seems to me to be an integral part of a, a coherent pattern strategy, looking at the protection for, uh, of a global portfolio. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. One of the things that, uh, that we do as a, matter of, as a matter of course in the, uh, with our filings in the UK, we'll file, um, a, typically for clients, we'll file a PCT application and we also will file a parallel British national application. And the reason for that is that if you do that and, and request examination and search at the time of filing, you can get a very rapid examination in the UK. It's, a, it's considered to be a sophisticated patent office, so you get serious examination. And it's not unusual to be able to get claims through almost before the end of the PCT national phase period. So at the time when you're then going into the uh, national phase um, into India, Japan, US, wherever, you've already got, if not grants, then something approaching an allowance position in the UK, which you can then roll out and translate into uh, 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 accelerated sort of consideration in the other jurisdictions. So I think there are a lot of, a lot of, con uh, a lot of different elements of PPH that are, are much more than just simply moving your case along quickly. They're a part of an integrated, sophisticated, coherent patent strategy for implementing global protection. And, and that's what I hope makes us all good attorneys, that we can learn to take advantage of, of those things. Um, I actually have a, a few statistics that I can throw out that point to the fact that there are offices, as Raj said, that are very receptive to PPH, um, and there are other offices that, while the grant rate is higher, um, will still uh, not roll over and automatically grant a patent because it had been granted in, in another country. For example, Australia is one that loves PPH. Uh, and if you file a PPH request in Australia, you have a 100% chance of getting your patent granted uh, in, in, in Australia, which is quite, quite wonderful. Um, the US is a little bit stiffer. The US has about a 73% grant rate for all applications um, and an 83 percent grant rate if it is a, uh, a, a PCT application. Um, Japan uh, makes almost no difference whatsoever. So clearly, even though Japan was the originator of PPH, uh, Japan does not feel it in, its re uh, in itself required to give discretion to other, other offices. Uh, Japan has a 75 percent grant rate overall and a 77 percent percent grant rate for, um, for PPH. But knowing all of that and making your good, the right choice uh, is part of you know, the, the, what it means to, to be a, P, uh, a, a, a good attorney. So I would just like to ask um, the, the panelists, maybe start with, with Raj. Uh, in your use of PPH, um, do you have a success story to tell? Or do you have a dismal failure story to tell? So I'll tell you, what I find is ultimately it boils down to is the quality of the examiner, okay? And what I have found, especially in the United States, if you are dealing with a junior examiner, okay, many times the junior examiner simply do not have self-confidence to grant the case, okay? I'll tell you one thing. And they are looking to allow the case but want validation from somebody else. And if it comes through the PPH route, it's almost like a official route 
which has validated the claim, allow, validated the allowance, and therefore they hang their hat using somebody else's allowance. Now, on the other hand, if you have a really experienced examiner, and I have worked with many of those, okay, they will not be perturbed or disturbed or influenced by whether you go by the PPH route or you provide all the documents to them, they will do their own analysis independently and come to their own conclusion. That's my, from my experience, it usually boils down to is who is the examiner? Is he an experienced examiner who knows what he's doing and has enough confidence or are you dealing with an examiner who is a junior examiner? That's my personal experience. Um, from my perspective, um, so like I mentioned, Singapore has some bilateral, excuse me, some bilateral uh, PPH programs. From what I've been seeing, um, uh, because a lot of our examiners are, are bilingual, uh, they have Chinese searching capabilities, and as you know, China files a lot of patent applications. So what we're seeing is, regardless of you know you submitting, let's say, an allowance from JPO um, under Global. Uh, inevitably, the Singapore examiners do consider the allowance in, in the other uh, office, but they do a follow-up uh, search and examination, very much like what Jay said. Um, they do their independent uh, search and examination anyway. With regards to some of the other ASEAN countries where it's not so developed yet, they tend to do the, the EV route that Jay was talking uh, about. That, um, that Raj was talking about, where they kind of just follow and use um, use the results. But um, I have had experience of using Aspect in Indonesia um, and in Thailand as well. And what I've seen is I still do get an office action a lot quicker, not the usual two to three years, but a lot quicker. Um, but it's generally a what I call a rubbish office action because what they've done is they've just raised any cited document and just said, here you go, there's an additional cited document for you to look at. And I look at it and it's completely irrelevant. So you just have to simply respond and say, sorry, this is, you know, has no relevance to, to the invention. And the next thing you get is an allowance. So I think examiners are at least trying to show that they are not just following um, the application that you're using for requesting PPH and that they are doing a top-up search and examination. So um, my experience is uh, in Japan, uh, even we do not use a PPH, we can get the first office section within around nine months or eight months. Compared to uh, if a we use a PPH, takes 2.6 months. So there's little, o only a small difference. And also, if we use a PPH, we need to amend the claim to the granted claim. So if we uh, amend the claim very narrowly, so we do not recommend to use a PPH because we need to narrow down the claim and very s narrow scope of the claim is will be granted. So there's almost no difference. We can use, not use the PPH sometimes. Well, uh, according to uh, uh, my understanding of the PPH implementation between Japan and Indian Patent Office, this will be easing out the burden of both the patent offices and the grant procedure will be faster and what the problems what we are thinking about uh, India has got a separate act of uh, exclusion under section 3. Uh, I don't think that would matter much because in US also we are having similar exclusion under section 101. In EP we are having similar exclusion under article 52.1. In UK we are having uh, subsection 2 of section 1. In Japan we used to have Article 35 for exclusion of computer related or software inventions. Of course, that has been now deleted. Now, if I look at the global scenario, it is the act is same. There is no much difference, no basic or fundamental difference between act of all the countries. 
So therefore, PPH implementation in India for section three exclusion will not matter much because Indian examiners, as Raj has uh, rightly pointed out, these would perhaps the give a impart a better clarity on section three K interpretations. Now, coming back to that, the as a whole, I can see the uh, patent procedure or prosecution system uh, will be much better, and also the number of applications and uh, time for grant will be faster. But the last, the last but not the least apprehension what uh, I do have, if who are uh, in India practicing IP, if they have noticed or not, I don't know exactly. If you happen to see, uh, Rule 55 of Indian patent rules have been amended. Why? Because Rule 55 had a bar that no patent can be granted within six months from the date of publication. Now that restriction has been now abolished by recent amendment of Indian patent rules. <laughs> the basic objective behind is that we are even expecting that PPH program patent application may be granted before six months. Therefore, the opposition, patent opposition, is likely to increase in India like IPR in USA. So, this is, let us take both the pros and cons. The, f the prosecution will be faster. The quality of patent will be better. But the possibility of IPR or opposition will go up. I, from the perspective of India, Japan, PPH, I think this is a really good opportunity, particularly for India. And why do I say that? The reason I say that is even though there will be 100 cases a year, if the Indian Patent Office makes an effort to understand those 100 cases and analyze them and try to understand the thinking process for why a case was allowed in Japan by the Japanese patent examiner, I can tell you this is going to be a tremendous benefit for the Indian examiners. And I always tell people, like music cannot be learned without actually playing the music, okay? In the same way, patent examination, patent prosecution is the same. Unless you actually do it, you cannot do it. You l cannot learn. And the best way I think this PPH can result in will be more learning on the part of the Indian examiners to understand the psychology and the way Japanese examiners are examining patents. And obviously, let's be very honest, the Japanese examiners have been doing this far longer than the Indian examiners have been and have a tremendous amount of experience examining patents. And I have a lot of respect, a lot of respect for the Japanese examiners because I have prosecuted many, many cases there. So I think this would be a very good thing for India. Uh, but on the other hand, we should thank Japan for reaching out to India and doing this very first thing the Japanese India PPH pathway. Because if it was not for Japan, I mean hopefully if based on this success, other countries will also join India and create PPH pathway. So I think we should uh, give a round of applause to Japan because Japan has the, uh, been the first one to join India to start this PPH pathway. Thank you very much to Japan. So on that note, first of all, I, I just want to say that I fully agree with Raj and would take that one step further, that it's not only good education for examiners, it's good education for us as attorneys because we now need to pay attention to the whole family of patents. We tend, in general, to pay attention to our own national prosecution and then leave everything else you know, kind of to our foreign associates. But now it becomes incumbent and important to, on us to be able to understand what other offices have, have done. 
I also, though, want to throw out a question that we have been debating among ourselves. Um, and, and we're running out of time, so we also need to open it up for you. But what we are plagued by is why did it take India, which is a, an extremely important patent office worldwide, why did it take India so long? Right. 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 As, as I said, I, I think your answer is, makes a lot of sense, but I nevertheless disagree with it because the U.S. also has that same requirement. Um, in fact, a much stricter requirement than, than, than in India. Um, and, and, and yet, um, PPH, well, first of all, the U.S. was one of the first to, uh, actually the first with Japan to, to launch PPH. And PPH has made a huge difference uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the U.S. where um, the IDS, the Information Disclosure Statement, which is our equivalent in the U.S. of, of Article 8, um, has made no difference. So um, I think that's a great try, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you're there yet. And furthermore, uh, Mr. Davi has rightly said many times PPH does influence examiners as it amounts to validation of something which has already been examined by competitive authorities. If at all we look at the process of PCT national phase entry, PC PCT application has also been examined by a competitive uh, examining authority, EP or US, etc. Don't you think if that has not been influencing so far examiners in other jurisdictions where national phase entry has been made? So it is more or less similar kind of a thing. Yeah. Yeah. The ISI International Search Report, that is also examined. Because in India, I have got experience, many of, majority of the, uh, I would say, PCT, this, uh, uh, this national phase entry in India, are initially certainly rejected, no matter how strong is ISI report. Can, actually, <laughs> thank you for that. And, and I am monopolizing the floor, and I apologize for this. But a point of clarification, we have thrown out terms like PCT, PPH, global PPH, um, and with apologies, many of you might not know what that means. So with PCT PPH, which I assume India will soon become part of, you not only rely on an allowance from a national office from Japan, but you can base a PPH request on the international search report and written opinion. So if the written opinion deems certain claims to be allowable, they can serve as the basis for a PPH request when you enter national phase or even in an, a non-PCT. And global PPH is a group of about almost 50 countries that agree to accept each other's examination reports. So for example, um, if, if the Singapore office allows claims uh, or the Singapore searching authority allows claims, I can use those as in a US application uh, as, as a PPH request. So as India moves broader into the PPH world, you'll see that the options that you have are, are, are going to grow. There was a person in the back. Yeah, I, I had a question, but before that, since you asked a question, I'll try to answer that. Um, PPH put sometimes uh, puts a lot of pressure on the examiners. You need a higher bandwidth and capacity in terms of examination of applications. And since Indian laws are quite different, at least we believe it to be so. So that's perhaps one of the reasons that India didn't join it before. But that brings me to my, my question from the panel. It uh, pertains to one of the aspects which you've already discussed. Um, so PPH is generally, in the common sense, is usually um, in the form which enables only a request for expedited examination and nothing more. In fact, in, uh, including the India-Japan PPH, it has a specific clause that um, uh, the applications will be examined on the basis of domestic substantive laws. That's in the Memorandum of Understanding. So my question to the panel is, um, as uh, Raj and Pasna discussed, that uh, how does the other forms of PPH, like modified PPH, in which you just modify the claims and file in the, app in, the, in the country, and you get it by way of right, it's granted. 
how does this format reconcile with the fact that the countries have different substantive laws on, on patentability, on inventiveness? They have different thresholds, which are sometimes set by the, by the courts. So how does these two things reconcile? How, how do we take that into factor that the countries may have different laws, but then how can they be allowing the applications without actually doing a substantive examination? That's my one question I had. Another question is like, is there any reason why the pharmaceutical and biotechnology related inventions are dropped from the India-Japan PPH, at least in India, not on Japan side, but in India they have been dropped. So any reason for that? Thank you. So um, I'll attempt to answer the first question, not so much the second question. Um, with regards to the first question, I mean, uh, as I mentioned on my slide on Singapore, um, that we dropped the modified examination route as of 1st January 2020, and that was exactly the reason, because um, what the Singapore Patent Office decided was, you know what, with the modified exam, with people just using allowance in a foreign country and, and conforming their Singapore application to those allowed claims and then getting a grant in Singapore, it was causing a lot of problems when, um, you know, there was no substantive examination of those claims going on. So the standards of the patents were quite, quite differing. And for that very reason, they said, you know, we need to stop this route and we just need to have all applications examined locally by the local examiners so that there's some uniformity in what's going getting through. Um, so that was the reason that Singapore has decided to, to drop the modified examination route. With regards to Malaysia, um, I still feel that they have, they have a lot of backlog issues as well. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, because these countries are developing countries where the patent laws or the examiners are not so experienced yet, backlogs are huge problems. Um, and for that very reason, they are taking advantage of you know, what's been done in other countries. Sort of like the work sharing program, um, but also taking the easy way out to get things moving along. I am quite confident that in time to come, um, as their backlogs clear, uh, I'm quite confident that they're actually going to stop this modified examination route, use the PPH route to help still, um, but still do an independent examination. So I, I feel that's the way things are moving forward. So uh, let me try to answer your question. First question regarding even though the laws are different, why should the claims be the same? Let me wear my academic hat as a professor, okay? When the claims are the same, the invention is the same. The prior art is the same, <coughs> am I correct? The prior art is the same, whether it's you're looking at prior art for an examiner in India or a prior art as an examiner in uh, U uh, US or Japan. So the point is, if the invention is the same, the prior art is the same, theoretically, <laughs> theoretically, there should be no difference because you should be looking at the difference between the prior art and your claimed invention to finally come up with what the boundary of your invention should be. So from a very theoretical point of view, there really should not be any difference irrespective of uh, different countries. But countries have created all sorts of nuances and variations in patent law. But think of it on a very fundamental basis. There should not be really difference. So at some point, in uh, we should all be striving towards uniformity. So in that respect, using granted claims somewhere else and allowing it in a different country is not a bad thing. Okay, it very much works along the academic theoretical concept. But truth is, there are realities different from the academics. But I'm just trying to explain to you from a purely academic point of view, it's not, a, not incorrect. Okay. With respect to the second question that you ask about the drug and pharma, that's an area where we have a very unique and peculiar law called Section 3D which none of the, uh, nowhere in the world has that. And therefore, it's very hard to reconcile 3D with uh, the laws in other parts of the world. And therefore, I can see why that aspect must have been kept aside. The I think section 3D is so, 
Section 3D is generally has become so toxic that I think somebody did the smart thing to just keep it aside for the moment and bring it up sometime in the future. And maybe that must be the Indian government's way of d handling this. So let's not worry about that aspect of the, fa you know, the drug and pharma patents, which where Section 3D will get implicated. Let's keep it aside. Let's learn from the PPH experience, and then think about bringing Section 3D and drug patents in the future. That's my way of thinking. And if I were to recommend Indian government, I would have exactly done the same thing. Keep aside the controversial issues. Let's work on things which are non-controversial, and then worry about bringing in the controversial issue. Well, uh, now I'll answer your second question. You know that uh, the applications for, uh, you know, biotechnological inventions or pharmaceutical inventions have uh, substantially redu reduced in India because for the problem of Section 3D, 3D is the provisions what has been introduced in the Indian Patents Act. Now, uh, there was, you must be knowing, there was uh, a lot of legal battles in even Supreme Court of India. Now. If you happen to see the basics of that, why this exclusion was incorporated in Indian Patents Act? There are two issues are coming. I'm telling it in a broader sense. You know, purchasing power parity was one issue. And second issue is that our Patents Act or Patents Law has taken its spirit from Constitution of India. Now, there, the public health is one of the most important issue. And this section 3D was stopped because for using, say, second or third use of one same uh, compound. It's not a new compound. So this would have increased a lot of litigations. And maybe, you know, a lot of patent protection used to be obtained, which would have hampered the purchasing power of the, uh, you know, relatively poor uh, uh, economy of India. So these were the two basic issues for which 3D was imposed. And for that, the, admittedly, there has been a reduction in uh, inflow of biotechnological and pharmaceutical patent applications in, in India. Now, I'll just before I finish it, what Dr. Raj was saying, so, uh, is there any issue, say PPH, the last answer, why PPH? PPH, let us consider it's a virtual office. Now, in, in global era, what is the difference in the law, patent law of all the countries are same? I explained to you the patent laws of all the countries are same, excepting certain exceptional issues like India, 3D is there, even in the U.S., Section 101 is being debated still now. And the matter, even the U.S. Supreme Court, they could not yet sort out the issue. The matter has now been referred to Congress, the U.S. Congress. So what I'm trying to say, that as a whole, if you see the patent laws in all the countries are the same. So examination procedure, if you happen to see, say, PPH, it's a virtual office. If instead of examining in Indian patent office, this is being examined in Japan patent office, or some of the Japan uh, cases being examined in Indian patent office. It's an extension, and this will help ease the burden of examination, will improve the quality of examination. This is my expectation. So Japan, Japan does not exclude the drugs. Any, with any, any. With respect to India, US, India, Japan, PPH. Yeah, most of the case, um, the like Brazil also excluded some part of the technical field, and then uh, last September they decided to no exclusion. So th this is just uh, uh, the pilot program. They wanted to try first in an understandable field, then move on to the next. Yes, there are, uh, there are IPC codes are given there in PPH guideline. And if you happen to see the chemistry and uh, pharmaceutical related inventions applications are not coming under PPH. 
are not coming under PPH. Only the classifications and the type of uh, uh, technology what have been informed, intimated there, those are only under coming PPH. Are there any other questions? I think we're already probably 15 minutes beyond our ending time. Um, so if there are no further questions, uh, then thank you for being such an excellent audience. And thank my, I thank my panelists. Um, and I wish you all the best of luck with using PPH uh, and um, getting patents granted as expeditiously and with as high quality as possible. So thank you so much for the session.